morning. I'm Shobna Narasimhan. I'm from the Jawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced Scientific Research in Bangalore, and I'm chairing this session, um, especially given the topic of this session, which is topological materials and phenomena. Um, we thought we'd pause a minute to mourn the unfortunate passing and also celebrate the life of this person who is Xu Cheng Zhang, who contributed so much to the themes of this session and uh, was a brilliant uh, physicist. Uh, I did not know him personally, but I certainly admired his work. He had um, many links also with ICTP, and this photograph was actually taken when he won the Dirac Medal. He was one of the co-winners of the Dirac Medal in 2012. Uh, the Dirac Medal is a very prestigious award given by ICTP. Uh, he also organized conferences at ICTP. Uh, for example, this one, which is, uh, it's on higher dimensional quantum Hall effect, churn Simon's theory in non-commutative geometry in condensed matter physics and field theory. Uh, the interesting thing to note about this uh, conference is uh, it was in 2005, so it was a year before topological insulators uh, exploded onto the field. So the Kane and Melly paper and the Bernevig and Zhang papers were in 2006. So this conference was like this one organized at ICTP uh, to introduce the themes of uh, the two talks today, I thought I would uh, use two quotations from uh, Xu Cheng Zhang. Uh, he said, as a student, I was deeply attracted to Dirac's style of searching for physical laws of nature by looking for beautiful mathematical structures. And he also said, uh, once you have a topological way of describing physical phenomena, there's a huge mathematical literature that you can exploit. And uh, in his Dirac medal lecture, he mentioned that he started out uh, life as a particle physicist working on field theory, and then he started getting very frustrated because he thought that the theories that he was coming up with, he couldn't find experimental tests for them. And then he went and talked to C.N. Yang, who suggested to him that maybe he should turn his attention to condensed matter, because in condensed matter, it's much easier to find experimental realizations. And so um, the two talks today show um, both aspects of this. They show that if you use these uh, theories that were initially developed either in mathematical physics or in high energy physics and field theory, you can discover very beautiful properties of condensed matter. And also, somewhat surprisingly, uh, condensed matter physics can serve as a test bed for theories of um, phenomena that you normally think of as happening at high energies. So uh, without further ado, I think I'm not really an expert in these uh, topics, so I think it is better if I turn it over to the two speakers. So we have two talks in this session. The first talk is by David Vanderbilt, who I think doesn't need any further introduction to this audience. He's been uh, coming to this conference for many, many years, I know. Uh, he's at Rutgers University, and the title of his talk is Axion Coupling in Magno Magnetoelectric and Topological Materials. Okay, I think we're in business. Uh, thanks, Shobana. Um, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, a lot of old friends. It's an honor to open, open the conference. Um, what I want to do in this talk, uh, you know, there's a huge development in topological materials, topological insulators and semimetals in the last decade. And I can only take a little bite 
Um, but the piece I want to introduce is the so-called axion coupling and what gives rise to so-called um, a, a kind of topological insulators uh, known as axion insulators, of which uh, currently we don't know any experimental examples. Uh, so uh, you could regard that as a disadvantage or as a challenge. I obviously prefer the, prefer the second uh, point of view. Uh, before I forget to uh, advertise the many collaborators who have uh, contributed, um, who are co-authors on various uh, uh, points of papers that I uh, will mention during the talk, uh, here are a few. I won't read the names, but uh, you, many of you probably recognize many of them. And I'll um, mention the papers as I go along. <clears throat> so what I want to do is do a very brief introduction uh, and review of Berry phases and electric polarization, which I hope most of you have some degree of familiarity with. And then I'll talk about anomalous Hall conductivity. And then the axion coupling theta, which is closely related to the Berry phase phi, but in three dimensions instead of one dimension. And uh, the physics that it's related to, which is a magnetoelectric response instead of electric polarization. Uh, and then uh, I'll talk about axion insulators. And uh, assuming I have time, I'll talk a little bit about some recent work uh, that we, we've been doing with my student, uh, Nico Varnava about um, uh, calculations on um, uh, tight binding models of axion insulators. As I mentioned, we don't have any good physical realizations in the lab yet, so, so we're working on models. Um, so I hope this gives you uh, a, a sense of one piece of what's going on uh, among many in the topological literature. OK, so uh, a Berry phase is uh, defined uh, for a one-dimensional insulator. I've uh, drawn the one-dimensional Brillouin zone here as a loop instead of a segment because it's uh, you know, pi and minus pi are identified. And I've plotted the en energy band vertically. And so the energy band uh, is a, a loop. And the loop supports topology, or at least a geometric phase. You can define a geometric phase in this way. UNK is the, uh, the self-periodic uh, block function. And from uh, this derivative with respect to k, you define the Berry connection. And then the Berry phase is basically an integral of the Berry connection over the Brillouin zone. Uh, there's a gauge dependence, which means if you put in a, a phase twist of the UNK, ANK does change, but the Berry phase does not change except uh, some integer times 2 pi. So it's well-defined modulo 2 pi. It's a phase. And uh, what is it useful for? Well, let's go up to two dimensions. And suppose I look at a two-dimensional Brillouin zone in terms of kx and ky. And for each kx along the ky direction, I calculate the Berry phase and plot it. And here I plot two images because they differ by 2 pi. Uh, either branch would be uh, equally sensible. And if I take the average value of the Berry phase across the entire Brillouin zone, what that tells me is the component of the electric polarization in the other direction, in the, in the y direction. In fact, uh, most of you probably know that these uh, Berry phases are related to the positions of the Wannier centers. So you can regard this as a framework in which we keep kx as a block wave vector uh, label in the x direction, and then we Wannierize in the, in the y direction, so-called hybrid Wannier representation. So you can also think of these as plots of the Wannier center position in y as a function of kx. And if you average these, then you get the polarization in the vertical direction. For a three-dimensional crystal, of course, you have to average in kx and ky in order to get. Uh, so here, phi is really the average of this uh, Berry phase over kx and ky. And uh, there's a surface theorem that tells you that the surface charge that you find at the surface, providing the surface uh, is insulating, must be given by exactly this polarization plus an integer. And the integer uh, can be regarded either as uh, in the 2 pi ambiguity of phi, or more physically, you know, you could add a layer of charge, one electron per unit cell, per unit surface unit cell, that would change the surface charge by that same amount. OK, there's another strange thing that can happen in rare circumstances. You have to have broken time reversal symmetry. So this has to be a two-dimensional ferromagnet. And in that case, uh, since the left-hand side and the right-hand side uh, of this uh, one-dimensional Brillouin zone are identified with each other, uh, whatever value the Berry phase has here, it also has to have here. But it doesn't have to come back to itself without wrapping. It can wrap by 2 pi or by minus 4 pi or by some integer times 2 pi. And if that integer is non-zero, then this is a topological system. It's topological in the sense that you can't adiabatically connect something that does have a wrapping with something that doesn't have a wrapping without a, a bulk gap closure in the two-dimensional material. And so this integer is called the churn number. And what it's physically related to 
is the anomalous Hall conductivity of this material. So most uh, materials uh, that don't have this wrapping, uh, if it's a two-dimensional insulator, would have to have a, a zero anomalous Hall conductivity. Uh, but uh, there are exceptions where it can be an integer. And if it's an integer, the reason why it's connected with the anomalous Hall conductivity here, I just give a quick physical uh, uh, idea. If you imagine applying electric field uh, in the uh, x direction, uh, so what that does is it applies forces to the wave packets and the wave vector kx migrates to the right. And as that happens, the wave packets, their y-coordinate, uh, the very, uh, uh, the Wannier center and the y-coordinate uh, migrates in the plus y direction, which is a current in the y direction. So if I apply an electric field in the x direction, I get a current in the y direction, even though this is a gapped system. So in that sense, it's an insulator, but it can support this kind of anomalous Hall current. Uh, since 2013, uh, we've had uh, experimental realizations of this two-dimensional quantum anomalous Hall state, uh, 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 starting uh, basically all of them that we have today are low temperature realizations in magnetically doped uh, topological insulator systems. Um, uh, so they do exist. We'd like to find uh, more robust and higher temperature versions of them, and that's one of the things that uh, we've been uh, working on off and on in my group. Um, but uh, for the purposes of this talk, uh, I want to go on and talk about uh, not the um, two-dimensional anomalous Hall conductivity of a film or isolated two-dimensional system, but the surface of an insulating three-dimensional uh, crystal. So I can ask the question, so what I told you before is that for an isolated two-dimensional system, the anomalous Hall conductivity has to be zero or two pi times an integer. And so you might think the same would be true at the insulating surface of an insulating crystal. Uh, so in other words, you apply an electric field and you measure the transverse current at the surface, and you might expect that has to be quantized like that. And it turns out that's not true. This is an example of what is called an anomaly, something that can happen at a surface of a higher dimensional system uh, and cannot happen at, uh, in an isolated system. And the way that you usually get out, uh, out of an anomaly is that there's something else somewhere in the system that compensates. And so what happens in this case is if you apply an electric field, you get equal and opposite currents on the top and bottom surface. If you make a film out of this, the total anomalous Hall conductivity is still zero, so it doesn't violate the two-dimensional theorem that I told you before, but you have currents at the surface. And in fact, what happens is you get currents all around the surface, and in fact what this is is an orbital magnetization. And of course, you can have an orbital magnetization in an insulating three-dimensional crystal, and it drives surface currents that are given by, you know, by uh, m uh, cross n hat is the surface current k. And so, uh, so basically, the uh, orbital uh, magnetoelectric coupling and the surface anomalous Hall conductivity are the same thing from this point of view. OK, uh, the magnetoelectric coupling, uh, I just want to briefly mention, is more complicated uh, that I'm going to be treating in this talk. In general, it can be defined either as the derivative of polarization with respect to magnetic field or magnetization with respect to electric field. Um, you have to have uh, broken inversion and broken time reversal for this to be non-zero in general. Uh, it has lattice uh, contributions coming from atomic displacements, which we will ignore. In the frozen ion limit, <coughs> it has both spin and orbital contributions. We'll ignore the spin contributions and just focus on the orbital frozen ion uh, magnetoelectric coupling. Even then, uh, it has <coughs> uh, several uh, components. Here's the total magnetoelectric tensor up here. There's this green part, which we called in our papers either Kubo terms or cross gap terms. These are more or less ordinary terms that can be written. It's not obvious the way it's written here, but as energy, you know, uh, perturbation expressions with energy denominators. Uh, uh, and, but those are non-topological, and mainly I'm going in the direction of topological terms. So uh, in, in practice, for real materials uh, where all of these effects are small, uh, this may be uh, larger than the red one. But I'm going to be interested in cases where this red one can become very large. So the other term is a purely isotropic term. Uh, we write it as theta over 2 pi times e squared over hc, and then this is the isotropic uh, tensor. And this theta, this geometric factor, is written here. Let me write it here, where I, again, remind you of the definition of the Berry connection. Actually, this is a Berry connection matrix. If there are four occupied bands, this is a four by four uh, matrix. There's a trace of this uh, product of, of and this is called the Chern-Simons three form. Uh, actually, Xu Cheng Zhang was the one who first introduced uh, this formula in the, in the um, condensed matter context, although it was well known 
uh, in certain contexts in the high energy field. Uh, okay, uh, so um, uh, here's the thing. This uh, integral, uh, the integrand is called the churn simon 3 form. The integral gives you what's called the axion coupling uh, theta. Um, uh, again, the integrand <clears throat> is not gauge invariant if you do a phase twist or a unitary twist among the occupied states. However, <clears throat> the integral is gauge invariant modulo 2 pi in exactly the same way that the Berry phase is uh, only well-defined modulo 2 pi. Now, in the case of the Berry phase, it's, tip, it's normal for the Berry phase to be on the order of pi or 2 pi. That gives you the, you can have large polarization in some materials. In these magnetic materials, these magnetoelectric materials that we're talking about, this axion theta is usually very small. So, for example, uh, we calculated what it was uh, in chromium oxide, and it's a couple of orders of magnitude smaller than the other spin and um, lattice contributions in chromium oxide, and smaller than uh, other, these are other materials that are known to have large magnetoelectric couplings. Uh, but if this theta were on the order of pi, then it would give rise to a magnetoelectric coupling, which is among the strongest magnetoelectric couplings of materials that we know. So if we can get up to theta equals pi by some topological magic, we jump into a region that's very interesting. And so that's where we're, that's really where we're going. Okay, so I mentioned that the uh, surface uh, anomalous Hall conductivity is really the same thing as the magnetoelectric coupling. There's a minus sign because well, in my convention, when you apply an electric field in this direction, the orbital magnetization is defined by the right-hand rule of the current flowing around, but the surface anomalous Hall conductivity would be positive if the current were going in the other direction. But it's basically the same thing. These two things, when you've thrown away those Kubo terms, all of these things are, are identical. And uh, from a physical point of view, we can understand why it is that this uh, theta coupling it makes sense that it's well-defined modulo 2 pi, because if I start with some material, this white block of material inside that has some initial coupling theta, and then I glue onto the surface um, some quantum anomalous Hall uh, layers, each of which carries E squared over H of anomalous Hall conductivity, then you've effectively increased the total magnetoelectric coupling of this block of material uh, by taking theta to theta plus 2 pi. So, so that's a physical explanation about why it makes sense that this mathematical fact that the theta coupling is only well-defined modulo 2 pi. Okay, so here's the uh, analogy between uh, the Berry phase and electric polarization uh, and the uh, theta coupling, which is basically a one-dimensional problem, although here I draw it in three dimensions, but Kx and Ky are basically spectators. And uh, this is a fundamentally three-dimensional uh, uh, phase object. In this case, sigma is the surface charge and for an insulating surface, it's given by the Berry phase plus an integer. And in this case, the surface anomalous Hall conductivity for an insulating surface is given by uh, the bulk con contribution theta plus a possible integer. So there's a very strong analogy. Mathematically speaking, uh, you skip uh, dimensions. So mathematically speaking, there's another phase angle in five dimensions and another phase angle in seven dimensions, but I don't know what they are like, and I guess they're not useful to us. Okay. Now, what about topology and symmetry? So what happens is that if you have either inversion symmetry or time reversal symmetry in your crystal, then you'd expect theta to be equal to zero because it's basically a magnetoelectric-like property. And either one of those should vanish normally uh, if you have uh, time reversal or inversion. However, because it's well-defined modulo 2 pi, there's a, there's a, a way out uh, theta can either be zero, in which case uh, the symmetries map theta into minus theta. Of course, zero goes to zero, that's fine. Or theta can be pi. Then pi gets mapped to minus pi, but minus pi and pi are really the same thing because it's only well-defined modulo 2 pi. And there are two, well, there are more than two, but uh, you can combine these things with other rotations and so on. But in the simplest case, if you have time reversal symmetry, that quantizes theta to be zero or pi, and so does inversion symmetry. So in the case of time reversal symmetry, uh, in a material like bismuth selenide, which is one of the well-known strong topological insulators, it happens that yes, uh, time reversal, uh, uh, yes, theta has the value of pi. And uh, so that means that in some sense, and I'll explain that in a moment, you would expect a half integer surface uh, anomalous Hall uh, conductivity. Uh, also in the case of inversion, 
Uh, so here I have in mind a, a system that has inversion but not time reversal. So a magnetic, three-dimensional magnetic material with inversion symmetry but not time reversal symmetry. You also have the possibility of theta equals pi. And so we know that there's an ex existence proof for a material like bismuth selenide that it, this is possible. Uh, and so we've jumped up to a very strong uh, magnetoelectric coupling in some formal sense, but can we make it behave that way in the, in the real uh, laboratory? So again, I'm reminding you that theta equals pi means that there should be half integer uh, surface anomalous hole conductivity. Actually, each surface could have its own anomalous hole conductivity, uh, 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 like minus a half, plus a half, plus three halves. It just has to be um, one half plus an integer multiple of the, of the quantum. And um, uh, if we can create materials that behave like this, it'll be quite interesting. I'll show you some, some reasons why uh, a little bit later. OK, so I said this can happen either with time reversal symmetry or inversion symmetry. The case we know about, which is strong topological insulators, is time reversal symmetry. And uh, there's a paradox here. At first sight, you would say, well, the surface anomalous hole conductivity should be non-zero because it's given by this bulk theta, which is non-zero. On the other hand, if I make a crystal light like this and it has time reversal symmetry, uh, including at the surfaces, then I know that there can't be any anomalous hole conductivity because that would break uh, time reversal symmetry. So uh, what's going on? And what's going on here is that what I told you before was for insulating surfaces. If you have metallic surfaces, there's another term that you have to add, both to the surface charge. So for the surface charge, you have to add a term, which is an integral over the two-dimensional bulk Brillouin zone. If there's a Fermi pocket, you have to add up the total charge con contributed by that occupied Fermi pocket. F is just the occupation function. And for the anomalous hole conductivity, you again look at that Fermi pocket and you integrate up not just the area of it, but you multiply times the Berry curvature. So omega here is the Berry curvature, and that gives you a contribution to the surface and almost all conductivity. So there's this quantized part plus a non-quantized part coming from the metallic surface. Now, what happens, the way you get out of the paradox in a time reversal uh, uh, preserved system, uh, so strong topological insulator, is that these effects uh, cancel each other. So from the bulk, you get this formal um, theta equals pi contribution uh, to the surface anomalous uh, hall conductivity or equivalently to the uh, magnetoelectric coupling. Uh, but from the surface, you also get pi. And the reason is that uh, on these topological insula insulator surfaces, time reversal uh, surfaces, there's a Dirac cone. There has to be, for topological reasons, a Dirac cone. When you integrate up the Berry curvature inside that little Dirac cone, it's equivalent to calculating the Berry phase around the Fermi loop. And that's pi. It's exactly pi because of uh, time reversal symmetry. So this is pi, and that's pi. And the two things add up to be 2 pi, which is equivalent to 0. And so the total surface anomalous hole conductivity is 0. And uh, that's good. But what it means is if you have a material like bismuth selenide, it does not act like this magnetoelectric behavior, at least not unless you break time reversal symmetry at the surface, for example, by interfacing it with a magnetic material. Um, so there have been some attempts to do things like that. But you have to engineer uh, a new behavior in order to make this kind of material exhibit a large uh, magnetoelectric coupling. Uh, on the other hand, <clears throat> I want to talk about uh, uh, so-called uh, axion insulators. Axion insulators are the ones in which the theta equals pi is protected by inversion. Uh, again, the bulk uh, theta gives a contribution of pi. But the surfaces can naturally be gapped. The reason the surfaces can be gapped is that the symmetry that's protecting uh, the bulk topology is inversion, but inversion is never a good symmetry at a surface because, of course, there's vacuum on one side and not on the other. And so it turns out that it's very natural for uh, axion insulators, if we can find them, it's very natural for them to have insulating surfaces and, for, and therefore for the surface anomalous hole conductivity to reveal itself as plus and minus e squared over h with no extra work, with no extra engineering. And that's why um, this is a uh, an interesting avenue uh, to pursue. So if we can find these axion insulators, uh, they have theta equals pi, uh, the surfaces will naturally be gapped. Each surface will carry a half integer quantum anomalous hall response. The big problem is that we don't have any uh, examples of these yet. Um, there's a, one example uh, which is uh, almost like this, which is manganese bismuth to tellurium-4, which is an antiferromagnetic topological insulator. I'll say a, a bit about that, but but the big thing is we need new materials. Five minutes? Good. OK, uh, here's about the antiferromagnetic topological insulator. Uh, this came from a paper by uh, Mong, uh, Essen, and Moore uh, some years ago where they imagined 
stacking alternate quantum anomalous hall layers, layers having al alternate churn numbers uh, in a kind of antiferromagnetic material. And they uh, showed that theta equals pi was possible uh, in that case. And in the last few months, there's been a, a spew of papers, four, four or five papers, uh, about this manganese bismuth 2 tellurium 4, which is a kind of example. It's a little bit like the bismuth selenide materials, but there's an extra layer of manganese, oh, well, these are tellurides, but manganese telluride in the middle. And then one layer has spin down, the next layer has spin up, the next layer has spin down. And uh, actually, what protects theta in this case is time reversal uh, composed with a half translation along the vertical direction. That's also enough to, to reverse the sine of theta. And uh, what they find by doing um, uh, surface uh, angle resolved photo uh, electron spectroscopy is that uh, there is a, 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 a gap common to both the gap and uh, common to both the bulk and the surface. And if they do some kind of um, uh, high resolution uh, processing to get this image cleaned up, I think it's a second derivative of some kind. What you see, the big black cones are the bulk uh, bands, the bulk valence band and the bulk conduction band. And then inside, there's a Dirac cone, which would have been crossing all the way through the middle if the material were not magnetic. But because of the magnetic property, there's an opening here, just a little gap opening here. And if you could get the Fermi level right in there, then the surface should have an anomalous Hall conductivity of half the quantum. Unfortunately, the, the Fermi level is up here. So this is, again, one of these systems where there's a lot of defects and the, and the chemistry hasn't been improved to, to the point where we can bring the Fermi level down where we want. Um, this material, by the way, would have insulating surfaces on the top, but not necessarily on the sides, because the time reversal times half uh, translation uh, would naturally be a good symmetry on the side, and that would preserve the, uh, the, the vanishing of the anomalous Hall conductivity on the side surfaces, which requires them to be magnetic. So in the last couple of minutes, let me just uh, talk about uh, how you might observe um, this uh, behavior and what you might do with it. There's uh, edge channels and the magnetoelectric effect. Uh, there's also a direct way of, of measuring the surface anomalous Hall conductivity optically, um, uh, which I, I won't talk about anymore, but I think that's also an extremely uh, promising direction. So in order to get a better idea of exactly how the uh, various surfaces of an axion insulator, what determines, for example, the sign on different facets, uh, what we did with Nico was to take a simple model of a pyrochlor iridate. Uh, I won't go through the details since I'm uh, ob obviously a little bit behind time. But in this model, the real pyrochlorides lie up here as trivial insulators, but there's a region, this blue region, where we get an axion insulator phase. So we decided to play with this model. Uh, here, the blue curves are the surface states on the top. The, uh, on the bottom, the red ones are on the top. So you can see that on a given surface, uh, you have a, a nice gap, a reasonably nice gap at the surface. Uh, we used a method that was developed by Ivo Souza and coworkers for calculating not only the total surface anomalous hole conductivity, but its layer by layer resolution so we can see how it uh, approaches one half as you include more and more layers near the surface. And um, I won't tell you everything we find. I'll actually just tell you this is one of these things where you do the calculation and then afterwards you realize you should have understood this from the beginning. What happens is that if you have a crystallite, and two faces of the crystallite, like the top one and the bottom one, are related to each other by inversion symmetry, then they have anomalous Hall conductivity in the same absolute sense. That's the meaning of these arrows. Uh, however, we're going to adopt the convention of measuring the anomalous Hall conductivity from the inside to the outside. And in this case, these have opposite anomalous Hall conductivities, and I'll color them in opposite ways. And then the uh, total magnetic point symmetry of this pyrochlor is such that if you go to any neighboring facet, the anomalous surface anomalous hole conductivity reverses. And then here on one facet to the next facet, you have a change of the surface anomalous hole conductivity by one quantum. It means you have to have a chiral edge channel running along every single edge like this. Chiral edge channel is like what you find at the edge of a quantum anomalous hole insulator. It's a one-way channel only. Uh, if you, uh, uh, so this was for the antiferromagnetic uh, state. If you study the ferromagnetic state, you can play some cute games. For example, if you tickle the magnetic state in such a way that the magnetization is in the x direction, then your chiral edge channels run this way and they connect the vertical wires. If you t turn the magnetic field, then they go this way and they connect the horizontal wires. So by flipping the magnetic field, you have a little quantum switch where you can uh, a double pull, double throw switch. Uh, there are a lot of other games you can play if the 
uh, system back is in the antiferromagnetic phase. If there's an antiferromagnetic domain wall, then where the domain wall uh, hits the surface, then you have a chiral edge channel. Uh, if you have a single height step on the 001 surface, it turns out that you have a chiral edge channel. And um, uh, you know, these can be used to carry dissipationless currents and so on. So if you can really do this, uh, it might be very interesting. So, so one application is to engineer these chiral edge channels into your material and use them. Uh, the other application is to get rid of them. So if you want a material that behaves like a strong magnetoelectric, you don't want to have different facets that have different uh, colors, different uh, half integer and almost all conductivity, because then what happens is you apply the electric field and the surface's currents are going in opposite directions. By the way, it looks like you're violating uh, charge conservation here, but uh, that's not the case. Actually, what happens is because there's a chiral edge channel here, charge runs in and, and takes care of the uh, charge conservation. Uh, but uh, uh, at least on the 001 surfaces of the pyrochlor system, what you can do is add a half layer. I mentioned before that adding a half layer changes the color. So if you can come into this system and spray on an extra half layer, this is the kind of thing that theorists love to tell experimentalists to do, spray on an extra half layer of material, you basically change the sign of the magnetization at the surface, and now you have a consistent flow of surface current all the way around, and so now this thing has this very large magnetoelectric coupling. It generates a magnetic dipole field, um, which is as strong as some of the strongest uh, magnetoelectric materials that we know about. OK, so that I think I probably just squeezed into the under the wire. That's my uh, general introduction to this field. There's a lot that I left out. But I tried to emphasize the formal similarity between the Berry phase theory and the um, uh, uh, axion uh, theta. Um, talked a little about, uh, about materials, but there's a huge need for new materials. And if I can just have 10 seconds left, I want to do a little shameless uh, advertising here. I've just had a book published on uh, Berry phases and electronic structure theory that talks about um, uh, polarization, magnet magnetization, one functions, uh, axion insulators, and many other things. And over here on the table, I have some flyers that have a 20% discount uh, code on them. Uh, so, uh, sorry about uh, taking a little commercial, uh, but otherwise, uh, thank you for your attention, and I'd be glad to answer your questions. <laughs>